Ladies and gentlemen, let's begin. Let's, I think, very appropriate, let's talk. Um, we've come together today from all across Canada. We have schools and representatives joining us from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and all the way across the country into central Canada and Toronto. We're going to be talking about mental health issues, right? We're going to be talking about something that I think, frankly, in a lot of schools, we like to kind of sweep under the rug and, and say that, oh, well, this is not something that we need to deal with. But we know this is something we need to deal with. We know that this is something that the conversation has to be real. And the conversation has to be able to touch each of us where we're at. Um, and that's what today is about. Today is about saying that we want to empower you as young people to take action in your communities to make a difference. To take action, to take what is happening in your health classes. To take what is happening in Alberta in our comm classes. To take what's happening in our classrooms and let's blow the classroom doors off of this and let's start a conversation in which we're bringing together not just our students, not just our teachers, but let's bring together our community and let's make connections to those organizations that are out there and doing brilliant work who want to talk with you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk. And that's where we're going to start today. So Thank you, Terry. I just caught the mic. And welcome to you all for joining us today as part of the kickoff event for the Let's Talk Mental Health National Video Conference and Campaign. And it's really a privilege for us to be here and having this conversation and to have so many experts that have generously offered their time to be here with us. And I have the pleasure of introducing our four guest speakers, and I'll introduce them each one at a time so that you get to really fully appreciate what they have to say and prepare some thoughtful questions, and I'll ask a few questions of my own. Um, but before we dive into the first introduction, I would like to acknowledge um, that Take You Global and the Center for Global Education are very privileged to be able to be working with CHIMP, the Charitable Impact Foundation, and the Canadian Education. Education Forum, as they have made it possible to provide you all with matching funding. There is a total pool of up to $15,000 um, that you are eligible to earn and donate toward a charity of your choice. Each classroom has $1,000, and just for completing different activities, you can unlock your ability to access donations. And that's one of the reasons why we're also featuring different charities, some local in scope, some national in scope. Um, and so thank you to our partners on that. So our first speaker is Linda Monahan. Good morning, everybody. Hi, I'm so happy to uh, have this opportunity to speak to you today about the Prince Albert Writing for Your Life group. There are five Writing for Your Life groups um, in Saskatchewan um, associated with the Canadian Mental Health Association. Uh, our group has 10 to 12 members. We meet every second Wednesday at the Nest which is a Canadian Mental Health Association drop-in centre for people with mental health issues. We gather around a big table. Everyone has their own colourful writing folder with their name on it, and we have a big basket of pens. And for two hours, every second Wednesday morning, we write. I give the group writing exercises designed to help them access material from their own lives. Here are a few of the writing exercises I use with the group. Who are you? What are you? Describe yourself to someone who knows nothing about you. Or I ask them to write about a childhood memory or about a fear they may have. Each person is given the opportunity to read aloud the piece they have written. It's all about encouragement. There is laughter and there are tears. In the group, we often speak about the value of creative writing as a positive means to deal with emotional issues and how writing can be very, a very healing act and a powerful tool for coping with mental illness. Not everyone in the group is able to write easily or well. There are people who are dyslexic, those who have physical as well as mental challenges, but everyone gets the chance to have their story written down. For those who need help, I write while they tell me their story. The group is not about trying to create great works of art. The members in the Writing for Your Life group write, as the name suggests, for their lives. To be able to say, this is me, these are my thoughts and feelings. We all need to be heard, and writing about what is alive and real for us 
to give voice to our worries and fears, to everything that matters to us, is so important. Many of the Writing for Your Life participants have gone on to have their poems and stories published in the pages of Transition Magazine, a publication of the Canadian Mental Health Association. Seeing their work in print has been an amazingly positive experience for the group, something of which we are very proud. The Writing for Your Life group has been and continues to be a huge success. With funding from Commonweal Community Arts, we published an anthology of the poems and stories of members of the group titled With Just One Reach of Hand. Okay, sorry about that. Something happened. Uh, we chose Canadian Mental Health Week to hold a gala book launch at the Grace Campbell Gallery. The media was invited and the writing group members were interviewed for the local paper. Here is one of the comments made in the interview. Lou Ritza said, the writing group is basically my way of surviving, she said. It keeps me away from anxiety and depression because I'm not just sitting there. It helps me to release everything. I thought I would share with you a couple of the pieces from With Just One Reach of Hands. The first piece is a poem by Holly Spratt from which we took the title for our collection. Her poem is titled With Just One Reach of Hands. My face grows hot with anger. I grow to face my fears, the laughter and the joy, the sadness and the tears. People are afraid. They don't seem to understand that they could change it all with just one reach of hands. My mental illness is scary. I take it day by day. But how can I face tomorrow if I can't put this away? Or to friends and family, I think last, through the love of others, I can put it in the past. So you can see that there's a lot of courage in the writing of the, the people in the Writing for Your Life group. So Jennifer, I'm going to pass it back over to you now, and then we can get on to our, our second speaker. Hi, guys. So again, she just introduced me. My name is Jessica. I am, can I sit up more? Yes. I'm a recreation therapist, and I've been doing that for about five years at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Uh, longer before that, but it's uh, it's a really great experience to be able to help people with their recreation and leisure lifestyles. Um, when I mention that, you might go, leisure lifestyle, what's that? It's the things that you do with yourself that make you, you, makes you feel good, makes you escape, makes you get away, whether it be something from like writing, like um, we were just talking about, or even just the escape of some video games, as long as it's not all day, all night kind of thing. It's the things that make you feel like you've accomplished something, that you're part of something, that you can do something. And um, it's quite important to have that be part of your life in general, not even if you're ill or if you've already hit a crisis and you're in recovery, but before that fact, because we all want full and happy lives, and I think this is a way to get there. Um, I live recreation. I do a lot on my own personal time. Uh, I do a lot with the patients that I work with in the hospital. We uh, do exercise programs, social skills groups, special events. We go to movies. We watch movies in the unit. Um, do music, computer groups, drumming group with some big djembe drums. We make some noise. We let out some emotions. We, we learn new skills, and we work together as a group. So those are all just some basic kind of things that, that recreation could bring to you through one activity. But if you can brainstorm and think about it, there are so many different things out there to do. I mean, that could be one of your tasks to sit there and just brainstorm all the activities so it could be a reminder of your opportunities. Because it isn't just limited to what you can think of. Maybe someone else can think of some other ideas and some other activities and things that will make them feel well. So um, I'm not sure how much time I have, but I guess the big thing I want to kind of push home for you is what are those tools, what are the things that you're going to use and, and make you feel well, make your own personal brainstorming list, what, what's your go-to when you can't even really get out of bed, when you, you know, maybe you're feeling really sad and you just can't stop crying, sometimes it happens. And what are you going to do? Maybe you could like put your iPod on, listen to some music, or watch some videos, or do that one thing to kind of pull you out into the next moment, and then maybe after that you could... Go out for a walk, clear your head, uh, check out some gardens, enjoy nature, things like that. Like It's just very little things, but they're just part of kind of engaging in recreation and pulling that into your lifestyle. So you can just live that lifestyle. Um, 
And then my other thought for you, question for you is, how can you find it? How can you find these things? And it, it's a matter of I could tell you all day, well, try this and explore that, but it's on the process that you need to start to experience and find what makes you feel good and what makes you whole and what makes you feel like you've done something good today, even though it could just be for you. Maybe your friend doesn't have to know. You, you know, if it's within a, you know something safe. But it doesn't have to be something that everybody knows you do. But and it doesn't have to be something you're amazing at. But just something to do to take your, you know, self and feel like an hour's passed and you don't know how it happened. But you were just doing something that made you feel good. And I think it's important that you believe in yourself and you belong with something with, you know, your friends or you belong to the values that you have and you can feel that you're part of something that makes you feel well on your own level and then you become what you desire in this kind of way. I know it's a little airy-fairy but I think it's just a matter of doing it and experiencing it and seeing how um, different recreational opportunities fit into your life. Uh, what, what I'd like to do now is, uh, Terry, I know we wanted to involve, involve the students in taking a moment to gather a question together so uh, for either of our guest speakers or to even share an experience. Um, so rather than throw put you guys on the spot, uh, Terry, why don't we just take a moment now so that the students can come up with a question for either of the first two guest speakers before we introduce the next speakers. All right, so I'll tell you, this room is buzzing. Okay, so we have some great questions here. We have some great questions that are posted on Twitter, but let's go across here to a young man. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm really and Willie, what school are you from, Willie? Uh, Major General Griesbach. Major General Griesbach. And what part of Canada are, is Major General Griesbach? Edmonton. Is it Edmonton? Okay, all right. Willie from MGG in Edmonton. Over to you, sir. Oh, okay. Um, what do we do when a person feels like they have lost hope? Okay, and who should we direct? Let's pass it over to Linda first. Linda, can we pass that to you? What? Do, can, one more time, Willie, nice and loud. Uh, what do we do when a person feels like they have lost hope? What can you do when you feel like you've Linda, lost did that come hope? Through? Yes, it did. Yeah. What you can do, and what I do when I when I feel that I've lost hope, is I, that's when I turn to writing. Journaling has always been a large part of my life. Um, my mom died when I was in my teens, and when that happened, I needed a place to turn to with my grief and my fears for the future, and uh, all that went along with what happened to me and so I started to do journaling and that's always been a place that I turn to when when I feel hopeless is when I turn to my writing a lot of that's so powerful thank you Linda and Linda just giving you some some feedback there's uh, on Twitter there was a number of people who were commenting about uh, again Corey Fraser talked about the power of writing to, uh, to lift stories, yours and mine are so powerful in reducing stigma about mental health. So Corey brought that same point up and how creative writing is a powerful tool in exploring mental health. Thank you, Corey, for sharing that on uh, on Twitter. Um, Jen, do you want to pull up uh, some of the inter do you, uh, another tweet that we have over there that came up? Yeah, um, or Jessica, did you want to comment first on the resources of if, if someone uh, feels that they've lost yeah, hope? that's true. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's things online. There's um, distress centers. There's CAMH has an emergency room ER. It's in Toronto uh, at College in Spadina. Uh, that can get you connected with the resources that you need if you're in that state. Um, there's even just speaking out, like, I know it's terrible, it feels like it'd be horrible to walk out your bedroom door and be like, Mom, like, I've arrived at this spot. But it's part of, like, getting the help you need. Or even alternatively, when I was 16, I went out and got my own therapy, set it up myself, went to secret appointments, didn't tell the soul, but it's what I did when I felt hopeless. I got the resources and the support that I needed. So it's a matter of building your own safety net to support yourself while also then relying on other people and, and seeing that there is a light within the darkness. There really is. You just have to look for that one star in the sky or that that one, you know, moment where you kind of, you can feel it or see it or sense it and then just run with it. That's what I feel. I think it's most helpful for me. 
Okay, um, sorry, I keep disappearing. Um, I, I really have spent time feeling that I was lost and had nowhere to turn to. But I think it's really important to surround yourself with people who love you and care about you. Um, it's important to have a village, I think, um, when you have a mental illness. To know that there are people who care and love you and will support you and help you to get the, the kind of support that you need out there. Um, Family and friends can be everything, and you get better. Linda and Jessica, thank you so much for what you shared. Uh, Linda, your work is so powerful. Creative, lighting, creative writing can save and change lives, so thank you for that. And Jessica, in terms of recreation, another amazing way to stay healthy and, and stay alive. Um, I love that this conference is called Let's Talk Mental Health because... Um, it's an amazing title because it's exactly what we need to do. And the charity that I'm associated with today is my friend um, Scott has a charity called Collateral Damage. Uh, he also lost his father to suicide and he started a program where he takes photographs of the friends and family left behind by people who uh, committed suicide. And his slogan is, because not talking about it isn't working. And keeping issues like mental health and suicide in the closet is doing a lot of damage. So I also want to say how amazing it is to each one of you students out there that you're present for this conference because the information and the tips that you're hearing, you can now become a spokesperson, an ambassador to share that with your family, to talk to your friends and really spread the word. Um, so I want to tell you a bit about my story. I was very close with my dad. We used to go on canoe trips together and uh, got into all kinds of mischief. He used to take me to rock concerts. He was obsessed with music from the 80s and really got me into it. And I used to coach him on his business ideas and he would help me with my career. And then he started to have some personal problems. And some of them were financial, some of them were in his relationship with his girlfriend. And um, I started to notice uh, some changes in him. He was really down. I think he was drinking more alcohol than usual. And one morning we went out for breakfast at Starbucks, <clears throat> excuse me, in downtown Toronto where I live. And um, something seemed very different about him. He started to tell me his whole life story and he had never really done that before. Um, he was very teary-eyed and um, was making apologies uh, for things he had done in his life that he had never acknowledged before. So he was saying brand new things, and I knew something was wrong. Um, but I wasn't sure exactly what, because the important point, one of the important points here is my dad was a really up person. He was always, you know, very positive about my stuff and his his friends and and um, he was a volunteer he was obsessed with giraffes and so what he ended up doing was something I could have never imagined and um, uh, what happened was he told me and my sister that he was going out of town for a few days um, he didn't say exactly where he was going and he but he did say when he would be back and um, uh, we got a call later that night that he had ended his life. And this was a devastating shock to myself, to his girlfriend, to our family, to all of his friends. And um, one place that I was able to find some support was with the Toronto Distress Centre. They have a suicide survivor support group. Um, and it was there that I got to listen to other people who had lost people to suicide. People had lost best friends. They had lost teenage um, sons and daughters. And my sister and I, of course, had lost our dad. So because my method of self-expression is theater. I'm an actress and I'm a playwright. Um, I took what had happened and the only thing I could think to do because the, the grief was very overwhelming at the time was to write about it. And I wasn't even strong enough to sort of write it myself. So I had an amazing friend of mine. She came over, she brought lunch, she opened her laptop at uh, my kitchen counter, and she said, go. And I just paced around, and if I needed to cry, I cried, and I told her all these stories about how amazing my dad was and then what sort of happened towards the end, and I turned this into a one-woman show called Snug Harbor. 
And when I performed the show in Toronto, I made sure that we had a question and answer period after the show. And that's because part of the healing process for me was to share the story. It's so important to talk about what has happened or what is happening. And then what was amazing was we would turn the lights on after the show. And I said to the audience, you know, does anyone want to share um, stories that they have connected with mental illness, depression, or suicide? And people really opened up. People talked about suicidal thoughts that they'd had themselves. They talked about losing loved ones. Um, a young woman came up to me after the show and she said, um, we think that our dad is suicidal and, um, and I'm thinking of bringing him to see your show. Because part of the reason that I wanted to share my story publicly, because it is a very private matter, one person could hear how much pain it causes when they choose to end their life if they could be made aware of how much they would be missed, if I reached one person, it would have been worth it. So the next night after the show, there was a man and a woman in their 60s, and I was doing the Q&A after, and he put up his hand, and he said, um, I think you met my daughter. She told me about this show, and so that's why I came to see it. So I have to tell you that we had a big hug and there were lots of tears, but it meant a lot to me that he could hear from a daughter who had lost her father. Now, one thing that they say about suicide that I think is extremely true is that it is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And that if you can get yourself to that next moment, no matter what it takes, things do get better. And if you are feeling that you don't have any family and friends. You know, it's wonderful to be surrounded by loving family and friends, but sometimes you feel like they're not there for you. I want to tell you that there are some beautiful strangers out there that will listen to you. And one of the places they will listen to you is the Toronto Distress Helpline. And we're going to be, make that telephone number available for you. So if you're feeling like, but I don't have the friends and family that everyone's talking about, there are people out there that will listen any time of day or night. Um, actually, I have the number right here. This just in. Um, it's 416-408-4357. That's 416-408-4357. Um, I have a couple more things to share, and then that will be my time with you. Uh, in my research for writing my play about suicide, I had to look up what are some of the signs that you can look for when someone might be so depressed that they're thinking about ending their own life. And um, it was very shocking for me to read these signs because um, my father showed a lot of these signs and I couldn't believe that I had missed them. Uh, and that's why I'm very passionate about if you don't know, how do you know what to look for? So some of the signs that he exhibited, my dad was, he gave away things that were very important to him. He told us that um, he was going away on a trip, but not really when he would be back or, or where he was going. Um, he said things like, I wish I could just sail off into the sunset. And that he didn't think anyone would miss him. So some tips that I have for you are to listen. If you think a friend is down and they're saying things that are worrying you or scaring you, listen. And it's going to take a lot of guts, but step into it. And by that I mean have the courage, have the love for that friend to say, what you're saying sounds really serious. How are you feeling? And maybe we should get you some help. Because it's not your responsibility to solve their problems, you can't. We can't solve each other's problems, but you can connect them to a professional that can help. Um, so that's what I wanted to say, and thank you so much for having me, and I think you guys are amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Now, we will have an opportunity for you to be able to ask some questions of Tracy, but before we do, we want to uh, pass the microphone and the floor over to Carolyn. Thank you for everybody's patience. I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, how many people have heard of Kids Health Phone? Raise your hand. 
Okay, so many of you probably have heard of Kids Health Phone, and I'm hoping that in the next couple of minutes that I'll be able to share with you some things that maybe you didn't know about us. So I have a slideshow. I don't know if we can show the first slide. Okay, the first, so the first the slide is just sort of our introduction to say that we're supporting the mental health and well-being of young people in Canada. The second slide should be one with many circles in it. And that circle, basically, those show all the different things that young people contact us about every day. So that could be, as you guys were saying, it could be things like suicide, depression, but it's also things like what's happening in your family, um, what's happening with your friends, what's happening in your body, uh, anything that you want to talk about, big or small. We're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, so it's another resource besides the one that Tracy was also saying. So for young people, five to 20. Um, so the next slide, if we move on to that one, has a big wheel on it. And the big wheel basically explains to you what it is that we offer. So everybody knows us as a phone service, um, and most people know us as a crisis line, although we, like I said, we, we manage any uh, problem, big or small. You can talk to us about anything. But we also have things online that a lot of people don't yet know about us. So we have something called Ask Us Online, which is a web posting service, uh, a live chat, and we also have a new mobile app as well. So I'll go through each of those with you right now. So if we move on to the fourth slide, it's the Always There app. So on our website, it gives you information about it, and Always There has several features. Um, we'll move on to the next slide, and I'll show you the first one, which is that it is our information booth. So you can find information about a number of different topics online uh, in the privacy of your own smartphone. Um, and so you can download that app for free. It's Again, it's called Always There. And we made sure that it wasn't called the Kids Help Phone app. A lot of you tell us that the reason you use Kids Help Phone is because it's totally anonymous and confidential. That means that we don't need to know your name. We don't need to know anything that you don't want to tell us. So it's completely non-identifying. So calling it Always There also protects people's anonymity and confidentiality because it's not called Kids Help Phone. So if we move on to the next slide, it should have four panels on it. And the four panels show you some of the features of the app. So the first one on the left is called Feelings Log. So that is where you can choose from a lot of emoticons and choose uh, basically how you're feeling that day. So let's say on Tuesdays, you're having Tuesdays, there's a certain uh, time of day where you start to feel down. You can record that. And then if you want to, you can share that with someone else. You can let them know and for yourself. Uh, better understand sort of what your moods are during the day. The second panel um, shows all those different emoticons. And the third panel shows um, some of our stress busters. That's another feature. So you have inspirational tips, quotes, um, uh, things that are submitted from young people that are encouraging to one another. So that is uh, one of the pieces that we've got in our app. And then, like I said, we can uh, you can look up information on our information booth, as well as at the touch of a button, reach us by phone. Uh, any time of the day or by live chat when it's open. Okay, awesome, great. So I've already taught you something a little bit new, that's good. Okay, and then I'll just move through the next parts pretty quickly. So the next slide shows you our websites. So this is our teens website. We have one for teens and for kids. And that's the other thing is that we're called Kids Health Phone, but we hear from young adults all the time. So young adults between the ages of 17 and 20, it's not even just for kids. The next slide tells you a little bit about our websites again, including our phone number and how to reach us through uh, live chat. Um, our next slide is called Ask Us Online, and that tells you basically that you can create an anonymous, again, profile and submit questions to our counselors who will respond to you. It's not in real time, it's not a chat, but they'll respond to you. And what we know is that young people, if you've seen your post, Probably another 60 people have seen your post as well. So there's a lot of support just by looking at what other people have to write about. So you know you're not alone. The next one it slide is about live chat. And that shows you our live chat window. So right now we've got live chat services from Thursday through Sunday um, uh, from 6 p.m. to 12 midnight uh, Eastern Standard Time. And we're hoping to expand that so that people, uh, I know for those of you who are out west, you can still participate later into the evening. But you can see that it's a very simple dialog box. And that's basically because young people told us they don't need any frills. Uh, we went to you guys to ask you what you'd like live chat to look like. And that's the dialog box you guys chose and the colors you chose. And basically, young people can chat. 
And those chats last about 40 minutes. Uh, so there's a lot for people uh, that we know that they're saying online, which is just wonderful. We're really glad that it's a popular uh, modality for people to reach us. And then pretty much close to the end here, I'll just tell you what it is that young people are telling us. So basically to wrap up here, it's that you let us know that because we're anonymous and confidential, that's why you feel like there's enough privacy to reach us. So the majority of people in an evaluation we just did said that they're a little bit too nervous or uncomfortable to call, and that's why they chat. And gentlemen, the last part for our last 10 minutes, we're down to the end. We want to hear what you are going to do. All of our friends on the Twitterverse, all of our friends joining us live through the link, we want you to tweet out some actions you are going to do. You have experts here from across the country that are joining us who want to hear what you have to say and to offer you some words of encouragement. So we're going to mute the microphones for two minutes and then we're going to come back together and we're going to hear what you're going to do or have done. Uh, like share one of the things that was there? Yeah. yeah, share one of the action things that you were talking about. Well, like what I wanted to explain is like, when you find something you want to do, it find some like anything. Like if you like to act, if you like to draw, it shows that you are a person that you want to do something. You don't want to be down. It just wants you just want to find something that will not make you depressed, and maybe show that somebody you know can do the same thing as what you're doing right now. Awesome. So, what are some things we could do to raise that awareness in our schools? What have you guys were talking, shared some really good ideas? Um, are there any things that you that you want to share that, that you uh, either have done or, or want to do to encourage those schools? I actually have helped several people out of depression, and I've for some donations when I because I work and I've donated money to charities and stuff. I've felt like they need to be treated like a person and not somebody that's not normal. They are just as human as all of us. Yeah, yeah, so listening to that, what about, are there any school-wide ideas of things that have uh, that have been talked about? Maybe we have one here. Uh, Ms. Melanie, would you like to talk about one of the uh, ideas that, that the schools are looking to actually collaborate on? Sure. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we're excited about uh, working with our high school and the theater schools that are here is uh, a mental health fair. So with the input of students, we want to get ideas around what kind of groups and information would we love to have at this fair. And then we can put hundreds of students through that uh, mental health fair so that they're gaining information and making connections like knowing about the kids' health phone and that amazing app that we all learned about today and getting your ideas as to what kinds of strategies, what kinds of booths would speak to our students. So we're very excited about looking at how we can create that opportunity and uh, we look forward to being able to share some of that the next time we come together as a group. Awesome. So maybe we'll pass that over to you, Jen, and to, and, and to Carolyn. I mean, those are some of the ideas that students are sharing here on our site. I'd love to see some of the ideas that people are sharing at the remote sites if they want to share that on Twitter as well. But maybe we'll pass it over to you for maybe one reaction to that. And then if you want to wrap it up after that, I think we are almost out of time. All right. Terry, so you want me to wrap it up now? Yo, know, I'd love to maybe get some reaction to, uh, to, to, some, to some of the ideas that were just shared first by the students and then by, and by their teachers. Or react to the students or the teachers? Well, I don't, I don't mind weighing in if you have a moment. Um, I don't know if people can hear me, but I think so. I think that those are wonderful ideas, and I saw on the blackboard, or sorry, rather the whiteboard on behind, you know, all the different uh, ideas that you guys were able to generate in five minutes. And, you know, it takes more than five minutes to actually enact those, but those are wonderful ideas. I, th I saw modeling language, I think, uh, for the young man who reached out and helped his friends with depression and don made donations. I think just keeping up the awareness as you're talking about is really wonderful, and we really appreciate um, the support, I think, within our, our own social networks, which is great. And I was just going to say, if anybody has any other questions after uh, our event today, please feel free to, you know, use the chat, use our uh, web posting, ask us online. If you have any more questions, uh, we're available, as well as the other wonderful resources that other people today have uh, outlined. Great. Thanks for that, that feedback, Carolyn. And one tweet that you may be interested in is uh, one of the teachers said, all the staff in my building should have that app handy. 
So uh, obviously that's hitting the court today. Um, over to you, Jen. Anything from your team in Toronto? Yeah, well, we were, were all very inspired by uh, the courageous students who have either shared personal experiences, um, who have also talked about um, how they're collaborating with people in their family and, um, and in the community, making donations to charities also links to what this national video conferencing campaign will allow you to do, you'll be able to support organizations like the ones you've heard today and that you may have continued to hear about because we encourage you to conduct research and to learn what are the other resources that are available in the city where you live or uh, that are supporting people from across Canada, people of all ages. And so um, a couple of the action ideas that I would share with you um, that we've put together as suggestions, but of course we want you to start with your own ideas, um, could be uh, using the PA system in the morning and maybe getting permission from your principal to leave inspirational quotes um, or facts or tips to people in the school. Um, having a mental health sports twist, uh, maybe during intermission, sometimes we watch like a basketball game or hockey game and you see people go out, you know, in the center and, you know, cheerleaders dancing and such. Well, maybe you can run a, a game or, or some kind of fun way to interact with people. Um, you could do... Uh, an organi, you could make a little uh, special messages, positive messages to give people to your friends or people in your community and, and learn how to make some shape with it. You could think about dispelling some of the myths and stereotypes. This is what was mentioned earlier, like we're all people. Whether or not we're living with a mental illness does not make us better or worse than anyone else. We all want to create a, a culture and a world where we feel included and valued and respected. Um, and so dispelling some of those stereotypes can be a, another strategy. Um, just making a map of all the organizations, clearly kids helpful, mapping at 11,000 is, is amazing. Um, a poster series, you could make a series of posters that go up in the cafeteria. You could host a game show during cafeteria. You could do an improv game. You could play freeze. You could imagine, you know, visualize a character and how might you, it, um, intervene in a way to help someone get get the help that they need. You could have a poetry slam uh, with writing. You could all do your own creative writing or gather pieces and um, you could create a book. You could create your own show. Uh, you could also bake and have a bake sale and donate the proceeds uh, to a charity, a local charity that you feel passionate about. Um, or there's an online game called Mind Match that we have at Taking Global. So these are a few suggestions to build on your ideas and you have between now and May 28th to put those ideas into action and with support from um, using the CHIMP, the Charitable Impact Platform, you'll be able to access uh, donations, matching funds towards a charity of your choice. And uh, we'll be sending more detailed instructors to, uh, instructions sorry, to your teachers to help you with that. So thanks again for your participation to all of our very knowledgeable and courageous guest speakers. I appreciate um, the time that you've all taken, uh, Linda, Jessica, Tracy, and Carolyn. And um, Terry, I guess at this point I'll pass it over to you because from us, we just say thank you. All right, well, thank you so very much, Jen. Let's say a thank you. So our time has come to a close. I don't know about you, but I am feeling inspired. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just the beginning. Now we go from here and we take action. We have the partners, we have the tools, we have the funding, we have what we need, and we have you, right? So I am so pumped when we get together here again and wrap all this up in just a few weeks time, a couple months time from now. Goodbye everyone and thank you so much for coming. Have a great day. Bye. Bye everyone, thank you.